Welcome to the Gottesdienst Crowd, where we foster confessional integrity, liturgical preservation, and preaching that doesn't stink. We believe that the historic liturgy of the divine service is more than mere cobwebs of antiquity, but it is a true treasure of the Church to be dusted off and brought down from her attic to be enjoyed. So let's get dusting. Welcome back to the Gonestines Crowd. This is Jason Broughton, your host. Today, we have with us Willie Grills. He is the pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Dorans, Illinois, and he is the host of the number one Lutheran podcast in the Mattoon Circuit, A Word Fitly Spoken. spoken. Welcome, Willie. Jason, thank you for the kind words. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. <laughs> Um, and, and, and I heard you stole the show at the Bugenhagen conference. So Mattoon circuit is really, uh, punching above its weight now. Feels pretty good. <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, well, um, it's actually kind of nice that we're finally kind of getting together. We had talked about trying to do a crossover for, I don't know, since you got into the circuit and, uh, I, you know, you know how it goes. Right. <laughs> but, uh, I think we're kind of getting there. What I want to talk with you about today is the mortification of sin. And it's something that I don't think Lutherans really spend a whole lot of time talking about, like really focusing on putting to death the sins that are within you, really fighting against them. Mm -hmm. um, I think we tend to um, jump to the gospel promises, which are wonderful, and I don't want to make it sound as though they're unimportant. In fact, I think we'll find they're extremely important in the mortification of sin. But we just kind of let it kind of let it lie there. We leave it there. We we self-soothe with the gospel instead of really really trying to fight diligently against sin. And Lutherans would probably begin with uh the fourth part of baptism. What does such baptizing indicate that by daily contrition and repentance the old Adam and us would uh, be drowned and die with all evil and sinful desires so that a new man could daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. And and St. Paul, he makes this statement in the middle of Romans 8, where he says, you know, we're not debtors to the flesh, but if we put to sin, uh, if we put to death by the Spirit— the deeds of the body, then we will live. And here he is, I mean, this is a command to you, right? It's a command that he's speaking to the renewed man, to the Christian, that this is a work that you take part in. So how does that actually happen? How do we put to death as Christians, the renewed man, the, the new men within us, how do we put to death the deeds of the body. Yeah, very, um, very good question. And I think the first thing we have to answer is why we would want to. <laughs> right. Uh, we sometimes have this idea that um, that sin. We well, we might be able to admit that sin could have temporal consequences, but we're a little more hesitant to say that sin will have eternal consequences. <laughs> Which is crazy, right? Because right. that's the entire point of sin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that sin is crouching at the door, and it wants to be your master, and it's going to do what it can to attack you and 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 make you its its uh, hostage, and it wants to do that so that it can drag you off to hell. Mm -hmm. You know, if we can personify sin as Scripture does sometimes. So that we know that sin will do a number of things. It will destroy us, body and soul. It can destroy families. Sin can bring down nations. And uh, sin can cause us to um, lose our salvation. You can lose the prize. Um, and that, that is a stark thing to consider. But it can, sin can so consume the Christian, or say the baptized person in this case, that... Um, that they lose fa saving faith. And I mean, this is David, right? With right, Bathsheba, yeah. Psalm yeah. 51. Right. And, you know, we believe David uh, found repentance. And of course, anyone can find repentance. But when we start talking about these subjects, this is kind of what happens. You know, it's, we get into these, well, what ifs? Like, so you're saying that if I commit this one sin, that I'm automatically damned? 
Well, no, not necessarily. Um, but when you're talking about willful sin that goes unconfessed and uh, willful habitual sin continually over and over where you are giving into the passions of the flesh and where you're neglecting the things of God, um, that puts you in a very dangerous situation. And, and so it clouds our minds as well. And because of sin, I think this is why we don't think of this as important. The mortification of the flesh is important because we've deluded ourselves into thinking that, well, it really doesn't matter what I do with my body, right? Right. Or, or if sin just begins in the heart, well, no harm, no foul. Uh, and so we, we just find ourselves in this um, sort of an antinomian spirit, yeah, but we also become a little bit baptistic in a way, this sort of once saved, always saved. You yeah. know, and, and for us, we're not going to say once I made my decision, but we might say, you know, once I've gone through X, Y, or Z, you know, then I'm good. And plus, it, as you know, Jason, if your name is on a Missouri Synod church roll, you are automatically uh, uh, escorted into heaven right, when your time right. comes. Um, I, yeah, you don't have to pass go right through the pearly gates. Yeah, the, the Lamb's Book of Life apparently was uh, bound in red leather at CPH somewhere, and it's in, <laughs> it's, it's in your church uh, office tucked away. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, or now online, right? It, oh, that's right. Yeah, we keep we all keep digital records. Yeah, now um, it's so, in yeah. the cloud. <laughs> it's in the right. Um, so then the question is, how does one practically begin to to mortify the flesh or subdue the flesh? Um, first things first, it's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. he, even Paul is, you know, continues to struggle with this. He will he will tell his church to imitate him the churches that he writes to, but he will also talk about disciplining, hi, disciplining his body, lest he should find himself disqualified after preaching to others. So the first thing is discipline your body is an active thing. Okay. It is something that you participate in with the help of the Holy spirit, of course, but you do have to participate. The mortification of sin will not come about passively. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, we can begin with anything, but uh, like, uh, okay, first things first, you know, what does a Christian need? He needs to hear the word of God and to receive the sacraments. So let's just start with, you know, one, a Christian needs to be in the word and in the divine service because this is through these means, God works on the heart of a Christian right? and God works toward that mortification of sin. Um, but I think that it's more, of course, than just going to church. When you're in church, you need to be conscious of what's going on. And we can all fall into this, too, because we're using the same liturgy week after week, which is good. Uh, it's what you should be doing. And we, we're, we're going through this, and sometimes we can absentmindedly go through the prayers. Right. Or let our minds wander during the reading or during the sermon. Or even the during the Kyrie. Yeah, right. I mean. right. It doesn't take... <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to be a long part. Exactly. So just you know, reminding ourselves on Sunday morning of why we're there and being mindful during that service. Now, now that's about an hour, hour and a half, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, where do we, what do we do the rest of the week? Right. Um, and that's when we get to uh, personal uh, devotion. And this is going to be both individual and uh, corporal, right? With, with your family right. around you. Um, I would recommend that you need to have both, that you can't substitute one for the other. You need to have a, a personal time of prayer and scripture reading and then the family gathering as well. Mm -hmm. And so on that, I mean, do you have any practical recommendations for, for home devotion then? Well, um, you know, for my family, we typically follow a, a, a pretty simple because we have some young children. Um, and so we just go through you know, a Bible history. And so a survey of the Old and New Testaments. Um, so we read the Bible stories out of the Bible. Um, then I, you know, typically have some discussion about it. But we just follow Luther's, you know, evening prayer. We have the the Creed, the Ten Commandments recited, the Lord's Prayer recited. Um, oftentimes we'll have an hi a hymn, but it's pretty simple in terms of structure. I mean, I, perhaps as the, you know, kids get older, we might get more, um, complicated, I guess, more complex, but I mean, 
oftentimes it's the last thing we're doing at just before bed. And so having it very simple like that is has served us well, but there are any number of things you can use. The treasure of daily prayer for corporal worship, I think you know that covers a psalm. It covers a Old and New Testament reading, and then oftentimes there's a pretty decent writing from either a Lutheran divine or some early church father or or something like that. So there, I mean, there are lots of things. The hymnal itself has a number of devotional material that can be used. One of the other things um, that contributes to our sinfulness is what we take in with our eyes. And of course, people understand that you're not, that a Christian shouldn't be watching pornography or taking in certain types of images and certain types of entertainment. Mm -hmm. But I would also say one way to be mindful of our Christian condition and one way to subdue the flesh is to have a home that actually looks like a Christian home. Now, of course, I'm not, I'm not, this isn't the, I'm not going like full eighties here, like saying throw all secular movies out of your collection or anything like that. But I mean, if you walk into someone's home, what is hanging on their walls tells you a lot about who they are. Mm -hmm. So that good art and every room should probably have a cross or a crucifix in it. In my mm -hmm. opinion, something that you can look to and be reminded of Christ. Yep. Um, when you are afflicted with sin, something that you can look to and be reminded you know, this is where the gospel actually does come in. You're afflicted by sin. Look to Christ on the cross where the victory is won. Mm -hmm. And so ordering not only our time in the case of church and family devotions, but also our architecture, right? Uh, a Christian feng shui, if you will. Okay. That, that, feel, that feels like syncretism. <laughs> I, I regret saying that now. But Great. Uh, I'm going to get some more. I'm going to get calls about unionism <laughs> and syncretism now. Right. So... Um, you know, to have and to have good art because, of course, there is bad Christian art too. Yeah, uh, you know, but uh, I th I do think iconography is good, and and things like that. Um, but but certainly uh, having crucifixes in the home, and any of these answers that we can give you aren't magic bullets. And some of you maybe the light bulbs clicking, thinking, "Oh, I never even thought about something that simple." Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, it is. Don't have you know, don't have evil things in the home, and that would include kind of you, know, you wouldn't put like a I don't know a pagan fetish doll on your wall, right? Or, right? or some kind of something creepy or, you know, e some black magic stuff like that. But maybe you would, you know, who knows? <laughs> who knows what, you know, you're given a gift. You've got some weird uncle who took a vacation to the Orient somewhere. He brings back some kind of, I don't know, fertility mask and you're, you're hanging it up. I don't know how <laughs> things get on. I don't know how things people get on, get on people's walls, but whatever, you know, a Christian home should be ordered and centered around Christ. And so not only is it, again, not just watching, you know, avoiding bad media, but also um, bringing good media into the home. Right. That would be one way. Um, because sin is going to take opportunity with anything that comes in, even good things. The devil will seek to twist into something bad. Mm -hmm. And so we have, to be, we have to be careful of that. We don't want to be superstitious this way, but everything needs to be intentional, mindful as, as we go forward. I mean, that's Deuteronomy, right? Where, right. you know, Talk about these things when you're sitting down, when you're yeah. standing up, when with your children at the gate, at the door, you know, put them on your doorpost so that you don't forget about this. Yeah. You know that um, the transition from sinner to saint is automatic in a judicial sense, but, but not automatic in uh, an experiential sense from the sense of sanctification. Right. And yet, nevertheless, in like Ephesians 2, for example, you know, one of the great passages where Paul is talking about being justified by grace through faith, he speaks about how you were dead in trespasses and sin and once walked according to the course of this world, according mm -hmm. to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So you were once following after the devil, mm -hmm. among whom also we also conducted ourselves in the, we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. Everything is past tense there. Mm -hmm. So that Paul does not speak of the Christian as a slave to the devil. Right. And we are not to be slaves to passion. And so there is a change that occurs, but as we grow as Christians, you know, that that's how the change comes about. Mm -hmm. So you can't look at this as as a podcast about Christian perfectionism or anything like that. This is this gradual and hard work. It's just like putting your physical body into shape, right? You're, you're going to work out and it's going to take some time to get where you want to be. Or like, for example, like you, are you still doing woodworking as a hobby? Yes. 
Are you better now than you were a year or two ago? Um, on some things. <laughs> <laughs> right. But this is how God is working, you know, in the Christian right. and building them up. Yeah. Well, and, I mean, and, I yeah, think you have a great point in terms of uh, oftentimes we, <laughs> you know, we learn to rule over one aspect of the flesh and in so doing, we uncover one that was totally, we were totally ignorant of. Like yeah, we had no idea was there. And that's how it is for like, for me in woodworking, right? I master one thing and then I realize, well, now I have to master this because I have no idea how to do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, when we talk about the mortification of sin, we almost have to look at some specific sins, don't we? Yeah. To understand okay, so how do I put that down? Because we, we're going to talk about prayer. We're going to talk about fasting, but sometimes that's just so generic. It doesn't really help us, right? Mm -hmm. It's like someone coming to you and saying, hey, I can't pay my bills, Pastor Broughton. And you go, hey, Jesus died for you. <laughs> Without some context there, it's a little, yeah. it, you know, it might fall on deaf ears. But yeah, so. or like when your wife is pregnant with her sixth or seventh child and says, how's the laundry going to get done? And you say, well, Jesus loves you. And he goes, she says, oh, yeah, was she, is he going to come and do the laundry? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, specific, specific counsel for specific situations. Uh, so let's, let's take, um, I don't know, you, you, you want to pick a sin? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, uh, okay, let's, let's go with one like this. Uh, this one might help. How about laziness? Sloth. Okay. Okay. Right, we'll, we'll get into some spicier ones later, but let's take sloth because that kind of ties into what we've already been talking about. Yeah. So sloth is going to affect a Christian in a couple of ways. Um, he's going to not want to work um, spiritually, like in his Christian life, he's not going to, going to want to go to church. He's not going to want to pray, things like that. But it's also going to affect him, say, financially. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, you can be lazy in both, although usually I see it this way. People will be very energized and zealous for their secular work and very lazy when it comes to the Christian side of things. Mm -hmm. So how does one avoid that? How does one avoid laziness? Um, and of course, laziness leads to a host of other sins, right? Laziness yes. leads to neglect and neglect leads to all kinds of other things. So it's just, it's a snowball. Effect. Yeah. Again, that's David and Bathsheba. Yeah. So um, what would you say to someone uh, who, who is struggling with slothfulness? I mean, I mean, outright, you're going to say, get up and do what you need to do. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, this yeah. is what God has called you to do. This is where he has put you. Get after what God has put you to do. Yeah. Yeah. And if someone's coming to you saying, I'm struggling with this, you know that their conscience is already pricked right. concerning that. And so they're ready to hear this. Um, what they don't need to hear is pat them on the head and go, eh, it's okay. Right. Don't worry about it. God's cool. And, you know, they need to be told, yeah, you're right. You are right to be convicted by this sin. And here's how we, you know, here's the forgiveness of that sin, but here's then now how we conquer the actual committing of that sin. Right. And so um, it could be something as practical. And this, and this kind of thing would also apply to prayer and devotion of you make a schedule and you live by that. Right. Discipline kind of implies routine. Yes. And so you, you have to have that routine. If you say, well, sometime this afternoon, I'm going to do X, you're not going to do it. Yeah, it doesn't get done. It doesn't get done. So you're going well, to because get everything that gets done has a time and a place. Correct. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, look, you know, you have church 10 o'clock on Sunday or whatever, right? Or mm -hmm. 7 o'clock on Saturday in your case. Uh, you know, what, you know you're, you've got your service time set and people are going to go. If you just said, hey, at some point Sunday, we're going to have a service. What's that going to look like, right? Or, you know, if you don't have a, a set dinner time, when are the kids going to get fed? Right. Uh, all very elementary stuff. But, you know, let's say, let's say you've got to get up and work and you've got to be out the door by 6 a.m. That might mean <laughs> that you're getting up a half an hour earlier mm -hmm. to pray or to read or to do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, if your family time is lacking then you need to readjust the schedule to, for the sake of the family. Some sports are going to have to go. Some, mm -hmm. you know, your time with the boys at the bar or wherever, it's going to have to go. It's going to take a willingness to sacrifice, but a discipline to, to schedule things. Right. Uh, 
because I mean, you know how kids are today, right? They're much more busy than than I ever was, and they're much more busy than a lot of adults. And so families and, and couples just pass like ships in the night. And I really believe that the devil wants to keep us busy. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is also a way in which we break um, you know, the commandment to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Mm-hmm. We forget that rest is built into creation, right? but the devil keeps us busy and busy. And in that busy schedule, he rips from us the opportunity to study the word and rips from us the opportunity to grow together as Christian families. Mm-hmm. And so willingness to, to be disciplined and willingness to sacrifice worldly things for the sake of time are going to help with laziness too. Um, because if you're just worn out from all that you're doing, <clears throat> you don't want to do anything else when, when you do have free time. Right. Exactly. There's a certain um, amount of energy that we have. And if we expend it all in one place, we necessarily can't expend it in other places. Like this is the notion between, uh, behind opportunity costs, yeah. right? That if we're spending all of our time in A, we necessarily can't do it in B. And if yes. B is the really important part, then we're, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a double whammy for us. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, again, a lot of this, dis- I mean, the general term discipline is going to apply to nearly everything that we talk about, but, you know, the discipline is going to look different depending on what sin you're trying to conquer. So laziness deals with times so you're going to need to, to schedule, but mm-hmm. you have, you have sins like gluttony and drunkenness. Um, those require different types of discipline. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that everything we talk about here is going to require prayer. Okay. Yes. As a discipline. Um, but um, gluttony and uh, drunkenness are going to require discipline of a different kind and the ability to say no. And I think things like this are where fasting come in, Mm -hmm. um, into play. Um, Now I'm not, of course, I'm not talking about fasting merely as a diet in the case of a glutton, but, but fasting, you know, what, what is gluttony? You know, why do we stuff our faces the way we do? Um, You know, what is the sin there? Yes. It's, it's the abuse of first article gifts, of course, but there's more going on here. You know, it's trusting in God's provision for tomorrow. Yeah. 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 And it's finding that sustenance and that pleasure in, in things other than God too. Mm -hmm. So you're not trusting in God. You're, you're, you're shoving stuff in and you're just sort of finding this. We don't really think about food the way we think about drugs, but it really is kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's happening. And so, right. You're not really depending upon God for your daily bread because you're not eating it, thinking about it. You're just sort of shoving it, shoveling it in. Fasting reminds us from where we receive these gifts. And so kind of by design, so you're skipping a meal, you're skipping two meals, maybe you're going to fast for a day or more, and you're going to experience some pretty severe hunger pangs the longer that you do it. Mm -hmm. But those pangs are meant to remind us of what we are missing and what we have forgotten, namely where these things come from. And also fasting does seem to have a, uh, I don't know, Jason, the best way to put this is kind of a clarifying effect, a sober clears effect. The, yeah, yeah, it clears the mind. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, mind and soul are, or excuse me, body and soul are connected in, in a way. So you're, you're thinking more clearly. And so, yeah, uh, it's a willingness, whether, whether your sin is dealing with alcohol or food or what have you to say, to push it aside and say, no, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. Well, and, we've all had lunch, a too big of a lunch, and tried to work after that, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. And it, and, and sometimes, you know, you just eyes are bigger than your stomach, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, but we we need to remember um, that, that God, the Holy Spirit, dwells within us. Mm-hmm. And that we're quoting a lot of Paul today, but no temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. And God will provide the way of escape. And sometimes the way of escape is to simply say no, right? I'm is to resolve not to do this, and to say I'm going to put the bottle down, or I'm going to put the fork down, okay, or I'm not going to call up this lady who isn't my wife, or I'm not going to have this inappropriate conversation with this with this guy I, I work with, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, if you're a lady working outside the home, uh, <laughs> if they've let you out, right. but uh, you know it and. And here is where we've gotten so mixed up with kind of this, you know, Fortean idea of 
law and gospel and of the nature of of man post regeneration. Yeah. We understand clearly from the Bible and from the confessions that the new man, the Christian, um, cooperates in sanctification. Mm-hmm. And what that means is you actually do have the ability to overcome these things. I mean, the Bible makes that clear. God will provide the way of escape. Right. And back to Ephesians, you know, uh, God has prepared uh, you for good works beforehand. Mm-hmm. So that God has already prepared these works, and God is the one who is uh, willing and at work within you to do them. That's what we find in these epistles here. Well, I mean, yeah. even in the Romans passage, that we're yep. not debtors to the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything. And, yep. and so it's already been conquered, right? We've been set free from it because, right. you know, the one who owes something is uh, enslaved to the thing that they owe. I mean, that's yes. what the Proverbs talks about. And so Paul is saying, we're not enslaved by the flesh. And so yep. you can say no, and you must. Right. And at this point, our opponents would say, well, what about Romans 7? Well, Romans 7, okay, yeah. Oh, wretched man that I am, who would deliver me from this body of death? It is Paul struggling against sin. This is what the mortification of sin looks like. Right. Yeah, you, we never say that you're free from sin. And the good you want to do, at times you're not going to do it. That's Paul's point. Right. That, that he is still striving to do the will of God, mm-hmm. but knows that for now it is going to be that struggle Yeah. until, until glory. And and so we need to stop pretending as if the old Adam is more powerful than the new. Right. As if as if the devil is more powerful than God. And nobody would ever put it quite in those terms, but functionally that's what is said right. in these circles. That you will just be utterly defeated. Um, which is a denial of the one who is at work within you. Mm-hmm. And it's a denial of the work that has been done in you. It's a denial that what G- our Lord did on his cross is actually a defeating of sin and death. Correct. Yeah. It, it makes it into just, and this is where, you know, um, like like um, uh, the papist or, or whoever would, would look at us and go, okay, see, it's actually just a fictional justification. Right. And, yeah. and they, they have a point if the radical Lutheran position is correct. But if the biblical position is correct, they don't have a point. Right. <laughs> and... And so, yeah, so when Christ defeats sin and death, it's not metaphorical, okay? Or it's not meant to be poetic, I should say. Right. It, he is trampling down death by death. Does he not truly rise from the dead? And will the dead in Christ not truly rise from the dead? And when someone is baptized, are they really not given, are they truly not given a new nature, a new heart? Mm-hmm. Are they not given eyes to see and ears to hear uh, through that preached word? Right. Um, so well, yeah, I mean, so, I think this yeah. goes to show just how deeply rooted sin is within us that we begin yeah. to doubt and not trust what God has actually accomplished by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. Right? That we think that you know we can actually get away with the devil made me do it right. instead of this being something that we've that that despite the fallenness and weakness of the new man in us or the weakness of our nature, I should say. Despite that, we're, we, this is a choice. Well, and if you can say then that I can do no good, what you're really saying is, you know, I, I can only do bad and it's out of my control. So like you say, the devil made me do it. It's not really my fault. And that's why you see like when a lot of these um, like big famous preachers have some great moral failing and, mm-hmm. and, and they have a very public time of repentance but then they start building back up their brands and they start writing about what they did. And it, they make it sound like the sin is just something that happened to them. Right. Not something that they did. Yeah. And it's like Theodore Dalrymple's the knife went in. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, so it's, it's, and so we have a lot of Christians out there, pastors included who are sort of reading on kind of the antinomian end of things. And it, it's always the same thing, but in flowery language. I really don't know why people are impressed with this, Jason, but <laughs> nevertheless, um, people love every Marvel movie too, don't they? Yes. And, and so, but my point is, people are out there, their consciences truly are burdened, and they really want to overcome something. And when we tell them, ah, you're stuck with it, mm-hmm. in every case, it, it destroys them. Right. Because so that's be- a really great point, often overlooked. Yeah. I mean, people, um, you know, for all of our talk about the the conscience, we really 
don't know what to do when we find one that's really pricked and really cut to the cut to the quick. Mm -hmm. And so a person will struggle and struggle and struggle with something and they'll go to their pastor and he won't really be able, he's, he's afraid to tell them that you, that, you know, brother, we can, we can overcome this, Mm -hmm. that God has given us this, you know, that, that let's, let's work through this and you may never fully overcome it, but let's, let's do what we need to do. Mm-hmm. And and so I think a good example of this would be something like alcohol abuse or drug abuse, where um, people end up in AA rather than going to the pastor or seeking Christian counsel, mm-hmm. um, because AA is giving them concrete answers and concrete steps right. for what they need to do. And many people, I mean, there are issues with AA, but many people have found success through AA mm-hmm. um, because they were at least given something to do, a, a way forward. Yeah, I mean, admitting it and admitting it publicly to those whom you love. And yeah, yeah I mean, exactly. Yeah. Um, and speaking of admitting sin, uh, one thing that would apply to all of this is uh, one way to mortify the flesh is to confess your sin. Mm-hmm. And if you are regularly confessing, well, it gets pretty awkward if you have to keep continually confessing to the same thing. Right. Um, but if confession is being done right, there is a time of counsel and advice there. There is a true forgiveness of sins in the absolution, okay? But there's also this time to talk about this sin. And, you know, if you know that you're going to be confessing this, when the time comes comes to commit it, you might actually think twice about it. Um, Because it really does have that kind of effect. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. But anyway, back to the the point we were making. Um, People are, you know, struggling in these sins, and we just teach them, well, you're stuck. Uh, because of an overreaction to legalism within some churches. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure 50 years ago, the churches were certainly more legalistic, quote unquote. But I just see the opposite broadly nowadays. Um, if anything, all sin is brushed aside. And so people who are really struggling with sin because it's the Holy Spirit convicting them will show up to a church and, the, and, and talk to a pastor or whoever, and they'll say, hey, I'm struggling with this. And they're going to go, the the pastor or the prof- the parish professional uh, will just wink at that mm-hmm. and say, "Oh, it doesn't it doesn't really matter." Right. Um, but that goes all the way back to the beginning of the podcast because we are forgetting what a toll sin actually takes on the person committing it. Right. Yeah. It leads us to hell. Absolutely. Yeah. It, yeah. And yeah. Now, there's kind of been a th- so in your discussion of laziness and now even gluttony and drunkenness. The, the, kind of some themes are arrive, uh, arising, I think. And maybe you can talk a little bit about it. Noticing perhaps the circumstances around which these sins within us begin to attack or where our nature begins to, our fallen nature begins to fight against our renewed nature. Uh, so talking about maybe uh, recognizing the circumstances in which you have yeah failed, recognizing even um, perhaps even the emotions or the things that, you know, run through your, you know, I can tell when I'm getting angry because my, my, my face gets warm sure, and yeah. it's like a, an immediate red flare that, okay, take a deep breath. Yeah. Take a step back. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So what are those red flares? Um, or maybe just talk about noticing those red flares, keeping an eye out to see so that you are aware of those circumstances when when sin is crouching at the door. Yeah, so um, you know, don't do anything that would give the appearance of evil. Is what scripture tells us. Right. So that you could also apply that to don't put yourself in a position to commit evil if you can if you can avoid it. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, if 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 anger Don't go the, to Hooters. That's right. <laughs> for the wings. Uh, right. Uh honestly if uh like if anger is troubling you and there's a particular place that makes you angry or a yeah. particular person, just don't, don't go around. If you can avoid that person at all, just avoid them because mm-hmm. you're just going to say something you regret or do something that you regret. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if the issue is say lust and pornography, then don't be alone with your electronic devices. Cause that's how most people are going to be consuming that today. Right. Right. So, uh, just get a flip phone, get a flip phone. Um, you know, put a timer on your computer. I don't know. I guess you can do that. I don't know, but you know, it's something, uh, find uh, somebody who can hold you accountable too. Yeah. You know, that trusted person who, 
you know, knows your weaknesses who can go, Hey, Fred is, you know, let's get out of here. Or, Hey, you might want to calm down a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just to simply, simply avoid those things. So yeah, you make a good point. So my, my, um, you know, my face turns red. I know I'm getting, I'm getting angry. I need to just walk away. That's a good, uh, that's a red flag. It's a good trigger. That's when you know that it's getting to be too much. Um, with alcohol, right? You know that once you get into drink three or four, probably shouldn't be, probably shouldn't be there. So put a strict limit on what you can do on right. what you will drink. If you can't put a limit on it, order a ginger ale or a yes. water, something like that. Um, because you know what's going to trigger you. If, if you're a person who drinks alone, don't be alone with a bottle. Mm-hmm. If you're a person who drinks socially, then pick your parties a little bit better. Yeah. You're trying to avoid that kind of thing. And, and I hate to harp on, on drinking a lot, but among Missouri Synod Christians, there is a big drinking culture. And yeah. there's, a, there's a pressure toward this. And actually, it's been kind of funny being here in Illinois because nobody really bats an eye at even heavy drinking among Lutherans, which we should, but we don't. But now we have legalized marijuana, which we're, which we rightly attack because it intoxicates you. Right. And so we've been kind of caught, um, between these two, these two ideas. Yeah. And it's just been interesting here. Um, but I don't want to get into a long discussion of, uh, so THC. Will, so Willie, what are you growing in your garden? <laughs> no, that part's illegal. You can't grow it. You can only buy oh, it from the that's state. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't drive by my garden right now. You will think I've committed the sin of laziness with all this rain <laughs> and everything. The weeds are, uh, are have taken over. So. Oh, yeah. That's every year for us. Yeah. But count your blessings, right? It just means that the soil's good. Yes. Everything keeps growing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think what you're saying is, is good to recognize what's going to trigger you, right? And, yeah. you know, sin, it's a strange thing. You'll know something is bad and then you'll just go right ahead and do it. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's worse when you know it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as long as you don't want to feel guilty and we don't want your conscience burdened, but I would say to the, to the smoldering wick out there, right? To the bruised reed, that this contrition you're feeling is actually a good thing. Yeah, because the fact that your conscience is hurt by what you're doing shows that the Holy Spirit is still there, that yeah. God is still working within you. The place you don't want to find yourself is where this doesn't affect you at all. Yeah, and it's very easy if we let our hearts become hardened. If we let them, it's very yeah, easy yeah. to do so. Well, I think I think that's a really good point too. On top of is letting that conscience pricking really set in, right? So. It, it, it's kind of hard to say savor that, but really taste the bitterness of it to know. Uh, so don't self soothe. Don't, don't immediately apply the gospel to yourself. Own it completely knowing that it's something that you did against God. And that was the thing, you know, one of the things that put nails in, uh, in his hands that pierced his side and that caused his father to forsake him. Yeah, I think meditating on that is actually a good thing. We've confused feeling bad with true guilt, and we associate guilt with uh, evil somehow. Yeah, yeah. As if that's a bad thing to feel. No, the sin is what's bad. Right. You know, it's kind of like saying, okay, I got drunk and I crashed my car. The real issue was I didn't put my seatbelt on. Or the real issue was the fence post. Right. Right. <laughs> That I, or the ditch I ran into. Well, no, that's not the issue. Those are the consequences, and guilt is the consequence of sin, but it's one that shows that you still have a conscience, and so, so it's a, it's a good place to be. Um, yeah, it's hard to say savor guilt, uh, or yeah. but le- I mean, really taste it. the bitter yeah. bitterness. I mean, because yeah. that is having a remembrance of the bitterness of sin, yeah. and what it. Um, you, what its fruit is in your life is really important because that's one of the re, that's one of the, the the impetuses to continue to seek to kill it. Right, right. And you know, you see this in in examples in the Old Testament. I mean, to go back to David and the consequences of his sin. Um, but those stories aren't only there to show you that eventually God rescues them. Right. The stories are also there to show you the consequences of their actions mm-hmm. and why you wouldn't want to walk this way. Yeah. You know, you, you want to be more like older, wiser David. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it's the, 
uh, what it's uh, is it? It's First Corinthians fifteen, and is it Romans ten? Where these things were written, the, these things happened to them as examples for them. Yeah, yeah. These things they were written down for our instruction. Right. That'd be that's actually uh, ten. First Corinthians ten, I believe. And Romans fifteen. Yeah. Now these things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warning for us on whom the culmination of ages has come, or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. He says that again in Romans, but I, but I can't remember. Right. But um, point is. Uh, yeah, that these things were written down f- as an example, mm-hmm. and and I was actually I think believe was wasn't that the reading a couple weeks ago? It was. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, who knows when they're going to listen to this? But uh, yeah, um, and how how much more clear can you be? Yeah, it's really funny. People will go, well, the Bible is not an instruction manual. <laughs> kind of is. <laughs> Yeah. The, the law can't tell you what to do. It's literally what it is. That's how. That's what laws are. You can't legislate morality, <laughs> right? Oh, oh, believe me, you can, and you should, and that's we do. Only, yeah, we that's still the do. Only, that's the only point of the law. Yeah, it's the only function in this in, in the civil sense, right? It, all laws are moral decisions to one degree or another, right? It's it's just amazing, and but do you see what reductionistic theology does? Not only yes. spiritually, but but mentally. Yeah, it makes you slow of head, right? <laughs> slow in the brain, right? Because you can't you can't take the plain meaning of words anymore. I know, you know, and and so and that's really you know why we're doing this episode, right? Very yeah. practical advice. Not this isn't even mysticism, you know. We're talking about meditating on the guilt you feel and the sin that you have committed and Christ on the cross, that's actually a much more practical thing than what people want to make it out to be. Mm-hmm. And they're going to go, well, you shouldn't think about that. And there is an unhealthy focus on your sins. You know, you, you don't want to, we don't want to lead into scrupulosity or anything like that. But if you don't reflect upon where you've been, you're going to go back there again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, what other kind of helpful uh, practices? Uh, you mentioned confession, I, and I am assuming that's individual or private confession. Yes. Um, how often would you recommend? I mean, you think someone should set a schedule also for that as um, best as as best they can? I think. I think. I honestly believe it would be helpful. Um, <sighs> But nevertheless, when you feel like you need it, of course, go to your pastor. Mm-hmm. Your pastor will hear it, you hope. Although I have bumped into pastors, I'm sad to say, who don't believe in private confession and absolution. Um, but private confession and absolution was kind of the normal mode of pastoral care for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I mean, even into the to the what we'll call the Lutheran era. And you even had this in the initial Reformed churches too, when they're visiting in homes and talking with um, with families and things like that. It's actually a form of of private confession, but people don't really realize that that's what's going on there anymore. But they, the point is, across the broad spectrum of denominations, this was a normal thing. Yeah, and then it wasn't. And so, yeah, I think a regular time is good. And Honestly, if you go to your pastor for this, he'll he'll make that happen. But our parishes, some of our parishes would have a set time, say once a month, you know, an hour or so set, like say fourth Thursday of the month from six to eight, I'll be available for confession. Now that's a, a very rare thing, but it does exist out there. I can think of a, I don't know, two parishes off the top of my head, I guess, that yeah. have something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, now that's for a Christian going to his pastor with Pastors, it's a little bit different uh, because they have to find their father confessor. Right. And it's usually somebody in the circuit. Um, for some a place like where we are, it's very easy because we're very close together. All of our churches, you know, you, 20 minutes, you'll hit another Missouri Synod church in this right. district. Um, if you're out in, I don't know, where, where would they be spread out? Montana, yeah. someplace like that, going to be a little more difficult. If you're Wyoming. a missionary on the field, it's going to be more difficult. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing this uh, via the internet. Right. Um, and, I, and I actually do think the laying on a hands part of confession is, is an important aspect to that right. Now, that mm-hmm. doesn't make the absolution, but nevertheless, I, I feel that that's very beneficial. Um, so for the most part, though, you're a layman. It's going to be easier for you to access this. 
Right. And just and just a reminder, you know, people bulk. I mean, not the goddess needs audience, of course, but right. we, we forget that this is the confession that's talked about in the catechism. Right. <laughs> and, and it's just, it's a very different thing from the public one. Not that the absolution isn't uh, effectual there. I'm not saying that at all, but confessing your sin individually is a very different experience from everybody saying the general together yeah. during the divine service. Well, you do actually have to think about it, don't you? Yeah. I mean, you have to be mindful of what that is. Yeah. And it, the, the general confession, I, again, it's it's easy to just rattle it off. Right. And a lot of times people are not going to tell their sins to their pastor because they're ashamed of them. They think that the pastor is going to judge them, or they don't trust the pastor. Mm-hmm. Or, or it's not specifically they don't trust them, but they're worried that if they say this out loud, it's going to get repeated. Right. And the pa- all of our pastors take vows not to reveal what's been confessed to us under penalty of, you know, damnation. Yeah. And so this is and a very losing serious, their livelihood. Right, right. <laughs> this is a very serious thing. And and we take it very seriously. Uh now, um the pastor has less and less of a role in people's lives as the years go on. And I'm reminded of the old days when uh you used to have to announce for communion which is related to confession and absolution historically. Mm -hmm. And so there was a time where, okay, you commune less frequently then, but you still, if you wanted to, you had to sit down and talk with the pastor. And I heard a reason why this fell out of favor in seminary from a professor that I thought was kind of silly at the time, but the longer I live, the more it makes sense. He said that the telephone was the real enemy here. Oh, Because then once that happened, you didn't have to come by the pastor's office anymore. You just called him up and said, hey, I'm going to be taking communion. And so you think about how easy it is to avoid talking to people once the telephone comes in. In the early days, you've got party lines and everything, so there's no privacy. Mm -hmm. Well, you fast forward to today where it's hard enough sometimes to get a member on the telephone. They want to do everything through text message or whatever. Well, that's another way of avoiding the hard conversations. You can't have a hard conversation via text. Well, you can, but I don't recommend it. Yeah, right. But it's sort of this uh, continual dehumanization and an isolation. That's what the devil wants to do. Uh, Keep you alone. Keep you isolated. Sin will grow in that way. Mm -hmm. And this is just another symptom of that, where where the pastor doesn't really have a regular um, counseling role in the life of his many of his parishioners. Yeah, they're oftentimes the last person to find out about it. Right, right. And, and, you know, (laughs) thank goodness for social media. Somebody will let you know. So uh, what kind of um what kind of role do like spiritual manuals have in the mortification of sin? Yeah, I think spiritual manuals are something that we need to bring back because people are a- always clamoring for this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Pa- pastors have something like the pastoral care companion, right? Yeah. So they that really helps in their job. That's not a bad tool to have. Well, what, what, what about something for the everyday Christian, a prayer book? And that's kind mm-hmm. of what we mean by spiritual manuals, a prayer book, but more yeah. than that. Yeah. You know, there can, there, there's kind of greater advice in those. Um, centuries ago, we had more of them. They fell out of favor. Uh, they've been replaced by personal devotionals. Right. And, and I won't name specific ones that I think are kind of trite because I don't want to get sued. But, <laughs> but I mean, there are some of these that are just so silly that they're not really going to help you. But right. You know, maybe maybe we should just bring back one of these old ones and reprint them for free or something. Yeah, but yeah, these kinds of simple books that say here is what you should do in this situation, or here mm-hmm. is a way out of this situation. Yeah, extremely helpful. There's this one by one of the Desert Fathers. Uh, his name is Evagrius. I think that's how you pronounce it. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, the English title is Talking Back, and it goes through all of the seven, you know, the cardinal sins, and it. And it says, if you're struggling with this, with regard to this sin, here's a Bible verse and a prayer. Right. I mean, really, <laughs> really helpful stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, something like that. Um, something a bit more modern would be like the confession mirror, you know, those those types of works. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, although that's that's more going through the Ten Commandments, seeing where you sin. Mm-hmm. But well, uh, Emmanuel Press has thing. something like that. Correct. Yep, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Is it the B- Bike Spiegel? Right. I just, I was only going to speak to Kings um, on this podcast. Because <laughs> oh, we're America. <laughs> That's right. That's right. 
in as middle America as you can get. That's right. Although I do live in a place that was once called Germantown, so take take it for what you want. <laughs> was that uh, in Kentucky? No, that's that's here. So our part of Mattoon up here, where the church is, was where all the Germans settled. Okay. And so if if you go to the uh, to the old news clippings, they're like you know new bell brought from St. Louis to Germantown, you know, or to the German <laughs> village or whatever. But they might as well said you know Crabland or something. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, they all settled up here, and uh, yeah, still very in, German in a way. In in New Judea, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that one. Okay. Um. Well, you know, we have a town. I think it looks like it's pronounced New Berlin, but it's New Berlin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In Illinois. Yeah, and you know, it's just interesting. You know, we should just well, I'll digress, and we'll do another hour just on immigration patterns and. <laughs> Why they why they have to go back? But so so finding some um, I guess old uh, prayer books, maybe not prayer books, but you know these spiritual yeah. uh, help books. Um, yeah, and you have to be a little careful because there there are modern ones out there, but they're typically um, Catholic. You know, there's like Manual for Spiritual Warfare. You'll find Manual Manual for Men, things like mm-hmm. that. Um, I'm sure there are some helpful things in there, but you would need a bit of discernment to do that. Right. Um, I would probably avoid um, books that are like, uh, you know, Introduction to Christian Discipline, things like that, uh, because that isn't quite what you think it's going to be. It's more a contemplative prayer thing. Mm-hmm. And so you've got to use a little bit of discernment when you when you look at these. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm sure somebody is going to comment once we finish, uh, you know, some great modern Lutheran that we – Lutheran one that we don't know about, but Mm -hmm. of course too, you know, everything with the the Lutheran moniker on it isn't recommended either. Right. There could be bad stuff, but yeah, I think finding the older ones, um, the ancient ones are very interesting and very helpful. Uh Um, oftentimes affordable. Yeah. And, and that's what you want. You know, these kinds of resources, I understand there are printing costs. They can't of necessity be free, but they should be as accessible to the people. Mm-hmm. We, we should not be, you know, seeking to make a profit off their spiritual progress. That's right. one step away from selling indulgences. Right. It's pretty close, isn't it? Right. Just, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, Tetzel is crouching at the door waiting to overtake <laughs> you. Um, any go-to Bible passages, uh, just in general, that we should just keep um, at the forefront of our minds and upon our hearts and even on our lips to say out loud. Yes. Um, a lot of them we've already talked about. Yeah. So basically the, the entirety of first Corinthians and uh, Ephesians, Ephesians two is going to be a good one. Okay. Um, uh, hold on one second. You can, you can edit this to make it, um, <laughs> uh, Philippians two thirteen is what would not come to my mind here. Okay. Uh, I kept trying to think of it the whole time for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Yeah. So, Therefore, my beloved, something like this, therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, continue to work at your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and act on behalf of his good purpose. And that's the big one to take away. Work at your salvation with fear and trembling, but it is God who is at work within you. So when we're telling you, and encouraging you to choose the right and to work toward good and to do good things, we're not telling you to do it alone. We're mm-hmm. saying work out your salvation for God is at work within you. And that really shows that the victory canon is yours. Yeah. Because and God is not going to fail. Right. And there's a promise. Yeah. If you do this, you will live. Right. Right. That, yeah. And that's not just a, in salvation. That's like actually enjoy life now. Right. Right. And um, another great one um, is going to be like in First Corinthians again, but First Corinthians six. Um, you know, uh, it's going to start off bad, but or <laughs> scary, right? Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men mm-hmm. who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. 
that God rescues you from this, that Mm -hmm. God washes you and sanctifies you and so forth. So it is his work on you that does this and that Christ is victorious over sin and death. And he gives that victory to you. He does provide the way of escape. And so I I think first Corinthians six is great too, because you get this, Oh no, you know, all this list of sins. Right. And then you say, but, and, and such were some of you, but you have been washed, sanctified and justified. You are a child of God. And the fact that you are buffeted by sin, buffeted by uh, the devil and the world is proof of God working within you because the devil isn't going to try to steal what's already his. Exactly. Yeah. So oftentimes, yeah, we can get very discouraged and lose hope when we are fighting sin because we think um, that, that this somehow must mean that we are not saved. But right. really the opposite is true. Right, the opposite is true. We're being attacked by these things precisely because we do not belong to him. We do not belong to the devil, and yeah. he is attacking us in order to gain his hold back over us. Absolutely, and yeah, I mean, we could just keep on and on, you know, with these Bible verses, just encouraging us to cast off the works of darkness and to, the night is far gone, the day is at hand, to walk properly. But ultimately, it always ends with this admonishment to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And to make no provision for the flesh. And that's the first thing you do. To mortify the flesh, you put on Christ. Mm -hmm. And so with Christ upon us, his name upon us in baptism, his blood washing away our sins, we have the victory. And it's a good place to be. We need not despair, but keep fighting the good fight, wearing the armor that he's given us. Well, excellent. Thank you for your time and your insight into the mortification of sin and the flesh. Um, We'll have to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. Love to be back. All right. Take care. Thank you, Jason.